this uh, program is something that we actually did in October of 2010. But uh, David and I thought that uh, between the fact that uh, all, we've had a, a significant turnover in some of our uh, attendees and participants, uh, we want you to be participants, not just attendees, by the by. And uh, the, the fact that, uh, that uh, this is a subject that uh, just needs, we all need to kind of go through from time to time and remind ourselves of certain basic facts that we thought that it would be good to go through this again. And uh, so what we're going to be talking about today is using section format and selecting the uh, articles from section format and selecting one of the four or a combination of the basic specification methods to specify the different kinds of products because we're going to specify uh, steel deck a lot differently from curtain wall and we're going to specify curtain wall differently from excavation and backfilling. So uh, it is well, a look, kind of what, what, what is driving this? Is it really uh, the products themselves? I mean we, we're titling this products and procedures so what's, what's making the difference of how okay. we should approach this spec. Well, some years ago, uh, when they published Master Format 2004, CSI came up with a new concept of work results, rather than um, the Master Format was really the classification system for improvements to real property. And some of those involve incorporating items of personal property, that is products like steel deck, curtain wall, glass, sealants that <coughs> the contractor purchases and then incorporates into a construction that is an improvement to real property. Procedures refer to uh, things like excavating, demolishing buildings, uh, backfilling, compacting dirt uh, that where we're not necessarily buying manufactured products and installing them but we are undergoing some procedures that again result in improvements to real property. In law you have the kind of the basic distinction between personal property, the stuff that could be moved, and real property that belongs to real estate basically. So uh, when we talk about products, we're talking about the things that we need to produce these improvements to real property. And as I say, the CSI came up with the phrase work results to uh, describe that concept. And I just want to jump in here a little bit and say I love this concept of work results, actually. And section format, uh, we have that right there in the center of the screen. Section format, because this is driving most of the discussion today, really doesn't address work results. But what we're finding in our own business is that we're trying to use the summary article of all of the specification sections to actually specify work results, uh, not just a list of products like you see in so many of the master specifications out there. We, we expand the summary statement to say what it is that we're installing it, sort of how it is that we're installing it, and where we're installing it, which is really a description of the work results that it's expected out of that section. Uh, so do, you I, also, do you also specify what it's supposed to do sometimes? Uh, potentially. Well, but, I'm, uh, we, I was we thinking... Focus in, on, on the what, how, and where. Okay, I was thinking in terms of... Um, I've done a couple of fire stations and the controls for... The, um, the automatic doors sometimes get a little complicated and so you have to describe uh, when you push this button here's what happens and when you pull this cord here's what happens and mm -hmm. all the different ways that you can open a door. Right. More a sequence of controls. Okay. Yes. So, so the thing that we're talking about today though is really centered on section format and this is the latest section format. The last one was published in uh, 2008 
Uh, and I believe, Matt, are we on a five-year update cycle for Section 4, Matt? So we might be coming up on a new release soon. Do you know? Um, I'm not sure offhand if there's a formalized revision cycle. Um, I could always find out and let everybody know. Okay. But I think that that was generally the intent. So it was published in 2008. We may be coming up on a new release sometime soon. But this presentation is really about following the current section format. And of course, the purpose for section format is to provide an outline for creating information that enables our users, the end user, the contractor, subcontractor, and supplier, to be able to very quickly retrieve the information that they need for their work. And that's the whole purpose. And so uh, it's a flexible tool that we can adjust depending upon the complexity of the products or the work results that we're trying to specify uh, and the nature and the categories. And that's what we're going to talk about today is the different categories of these part two products. And with that, we'll go straight to part two. By the way, um, I can't. Um, is my screen displaying correctly? Yes, but we also see that you have several uh, tasks that are like three weeks overdue. What's wrong with you, Lewis? you got to stay on top of this stuff. Oh, all right. <laughs> well, I can do this. How's that? Ah, there we go. Now we don't have to be bothered by all of your overdue tasks. Oh, yes, all of my undone stuff. Okay. So all here's right. part two. And, uh, and of course, the old, what I'm sure David is going to tell all of his students at uh, the CSI Academies is when you're writing or editing a spec section, where do you start, David? Part two. No, wait. You want me to say part two, don't you? <laughs> yes. Well, if, if you read the specifying practice guide, that's what I would say, part two. Where do I start? I start with the summary. Remember I said work results? That's where I start because that gives me the roadmap for actually writing the section. Next I agree. would be part two. Yeah, the, the section includes or summary can first give you a little brief idea, but when you get done editing part two, uh, you sometimes have to go back and adjust that list under section includes. But we yeah, can say that you may. In, in, uh, in the strictest sense of the word that part two is really the heart of specifications. Right. So, and the list that we're showing you here is, is the current list, all the major section t uh, article titles that would appear in part two. And What's happened is with the latest version of section format, uh, the, the team that revised it gave us an, actually an option as to how we use part two. What the emphasis really is is that one article title, you see it with all the caps and all of the bracketed choices, the emphasis is to try to use that single uh, article approach and then specify all of the subheadings, the um, title case uh, listings underneath that, uh, to specify individual product systems, manufactured units. Uh, but they've also given us the option to take all of those subheadings and move them out to make those major article headings. So we, we, we have a lot of flexibility as to how we're going to use part two but Lewis and I want to talk to you today really about trying to follow the primary emphasis that they're, that they're pushing, and that is let's look at doing a single article title and being able to specify everything in that. But keep in mind, it's got to be flexible because you have to make it work for your individual product. Now, one thing, uh, how many of these are mandatory, David? Mandatory? <laughs> What, are, are there spec police out there checking this, Lewis? I, <laughs> mandatory? None of them are mandatory. Heck, you gotta, you've got to use what it is that you think is appropriate, and that's what it comes down to, being able to select those things that really are appropriate for the content of the section. 
uh, none of these are mandatory. And can you add new stuff? Absolutely. You have to make it fit. So what we want to communicate is, uh, especially for our, some of the folks that are just getting started in writing specifications, is that don't feel like we, you have to have separate articles or that uh, you have to have all of these suggested titles, that um, you pick and choose as to what is needed for the given type of project that, product that we're specifying our work result and that's what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, let's clarify a little bit about what is fabrication and uh, what g would go in a fabrication article. What um, would go in there? Yeah. Are you asking me? <laughs> I, the fabrication is just going to be Really, it's the shop assembly uh, by the manufacturer to try to complete the the individual product, whatever it might be. Well, let's let's distinguish it from the basic manufacturing. Um, I have seen specifications where, in the fabrication article, somebody was trying to tell a manufacturer how to manufacture the the, the products that they make. Uh, the fabrication we need to remind ourselves is we take uh, what is a probably a standard manufactured item and we're going to shape it, we're going to size it, cut it to length, beat to fit, paint to match, whatever, to make it project specific. But we start with something that's uh, already made. So you have a basic curtain wall system that's they run out and, thousands and thousands of lineal feet of a, a given profile, but on this job we're going to have space the mullions at uh, five feet six inches on center, and so it has to be cut to size and, uh, and so forth. Um, architectural woodwork, you buy uh, MDF core panels, you buy um, uh, laminates, you buy veneers, and we're going to put all these things together along with hardware and come out with some very nice looking cabinets. They're being fabricated from manufactured items uh, into uh, uh, usable improvements to real property. Okay, yeah, and some of the things you're talking about here, Lois, I mean, you and I have gone over this ahead of time, certainly, and our, our everybody joining us doesn't have that benefit, but we do try to make some distinction uh, between the classifications of these products, and sometimes it's really subtle, sometimes it's an opinion, sometimes a product can go either way among a variety of, of locations of these basic product types. So we want to keep that in mind as we're going through, and you may have comments about uh, or questions about how we're classifying individual products, and that's great. I hope, and if you have them, I'd like to hear them. Uh, but what we're trying to do is give you some basis for hopefully being able to make decisions on your own as to how to approach some of these individual uh, spec sections. Hey, uh, we had one question from Sheldon Wolf asking, what is the hashtag today? Well, Sheldon, we're using the hostage uh, CSI SPG specifying practice group. So if you want to join in this tweet chat, I see Liz uh, Sullivan is joining us on the tweet chat, and uh, uh, hopefully a couple of others will be out there, too. Uh, oh, yeah. She's, she's a real tweety. Yes, she is. We like her. Yeah. She's a lot of fun. And, and we had a question from Tommy Smith asking if I'm suggesting, because of what I was saying with the work results in the summary, asking if I'm suggesting that we should break or divide up the work with the summary statement. And Tommy, I'm not suggesting that we try to assign the work uh, to any particular trade, if that's what you're talking about, or any particular subcontractor. I'm just trying to use these statements to make them more meaningful so that the contractor really knows what to expect will be the end result of the specification section. So, for example, uh, why don't you give us a specific example? 
Well, the one I'm using for a presentation that goes along with this is for ex uh, exterior masonry cavity walls. Yes. So instead of just listing brick, block, masonry ties and such, I would <clears> specify it as a work result, which would be uh, brick veneer installed over concrete masonry backup with insulated um, cavity. Okay. So I'm or trying to paint this like mental picture for the contractor. You know, what is this it, wall? Just to make it easier to understand what's actually in the, the, the given spec section. Right. And that gives me a better roadmap for writing the thing. Uh, there is that too. Yes, uh, um, Jim Carlisle has uh, a question. Would the fabrication article be used to make sure the manufacturer meets an industry standard for the particular product? And I would say no, that that's actually what you want to put in with the description of the product or the uh, performance or design criteria. Uh, the fabrication is for when you, we take standard manufactured items and they are cut to size or otherwise made project specific. So for example, uh, your toilet compartments, uh, we're going to list some standards about uh, the basic panels that are manufactured, but we're also going to tell them that uh, uh, about uh, that they have to, uh, if we have uh, styles that go from floor to ceiling that, that when they're cut that they don't show raw edges or something like that. I've got a little off on that one, but that's the basic concept. Well, let's get into this thing, David. Okay. And let's go to our first category. All right. Well, you're driving this bus, so go ahead. All right. Oh, um, David came up with this discussion key uh, as we look through the article headings that might be used for the different categories. We've got five categories, but you could divide it a different way. Um, if it's gray text, it's probably not going to be used. The red text is, is probably most important, and the black text are comp things that are commonly used. So just keep those in mind as we get into this thing. So our first one these are the five categories, materials, manufactured products, field assemblies, design build systems, and shop assemblies. So let's okay, go to... Okay, we're going to, we'll hit uh, design uh, build systems last, but yes. we'll show them, we'll do them in the order that you just said. Yes. Okay. So. So materials. These, we're talking about really the basic materials that go into uh, the products and I, I would look at these as, you know, think of the basic, uh, go back to the even the um, periodic table. You know, your metals, your, your liquids, your solids, gases, uh, those sorts of things. We want, we want to get back to the real basic uh, product or material information. And Lewis and I have actually looked at this and said, this category, this materials category, basic materials, can also include some manufactured products, things like chipboard, where it's almost a commodity kind of an item uh, that you're still using a manufactured product because it, it would be more than just the base gypsum because it's fabricated into a board, but it's still a real basic uh, building product something that doesn't have to require um, assembly from the manufacturer once it's fabricated. A metal deck might be something that would fall into that same category. Do you want to press on there, Lewis? Yeah, and, and there's some... Uh, yeah, I should have gone sooner. So okay. here are some of the suggested um, article headings that you might be using. Uh, materials, material types, and then finishes. So for our steel deck example, we'd have that in there, and we would cite uh, industry standards. The Steel Deck Institute would would say how thick this, it is, what uh, uh, strength of steel, category of steel, and uh, ASTM 
relevant ASTM standards. And then down in finishes, we might specify whether it's painted or galvanized or left raw. All right. And you see here, we have the main heading being materials, the main mm -hmm. article title. And that, that one is one of the selections of, of that gigantic list that had all the bracketed choices. So realize that we're trying to get this down to a real simple listing and trying to identify exactly what is in the specification section by the name of that article. So here, again, as Lewis's suggestion, we're talking about basic materials and individual then material types. But the finishes couldn't simply be a paragraph to it describe. Uh, and if you have more than one finish, because you might have steel deck, some steel deck that's interior that would be painted, and some steel deck that would be exterior that might be galvanized. And some that may have both finishes. <laughs> yeah, and or might have both. So um, some of the common specification methods for this category of materials would be the reference standards, uh, citing ASTM, ANSI's, and, and uh, uh, industry associations like the Steel Deck Institute publications, and descriptive. We just need to tell what the heck it is. Right, and this is probably the distinction, or helps to make the distinction, as to what might be included in that category. Because if we can specify the product by a simple ASTM reference standard, I think that that would classify it as a basic building product. And that would go to the gypsum board because we have a single ASTM standard we can reference. The same with, say, metal studs, the same with metal decking, um, even cements, uh, some of the individual components for mortar and, and block, that these can all be considered basic building products because they can all be done as reference standards. I mean, literally, Lewis, do you care who manufactures your concrete block? No. No, so we yeah. don't really need to specify the manufacturer and don't even really care. Um, Kevin O'Baron has a, a comment. There was a question. He says there was a question earlier about what should be specified in the fabrication article. Users should be aware that section format has detailed description of the types of information that is intended to be presented in various articles and main paragraphs indicated in section format. And of course, he is quite right on that. Yeah, there, if you do bother to but read there are some basic format. confusions, Kevin, and I'll tell you, there's some things in master spec where uh, the authors are t trying to tell a manufacturer how to manufacture a given product. Right, uh, and so. that's, that's something that we probably want to avoid unless, of course, we're talking about, I mean, we're looking Something here now at the manufactured products, and this is probably where that really applies, because there are many manufactured products that have multiple options. They have, uh, as we're saying here, there are some standard, there are custom products. Uh, they can select from, as you were starting earlier, Lewis, a variety of finishes or maybe a variety of components that go into the product. Uh, you, you started talking about um, the casework, and and there are manufactured casework products that you can buy, but you have a, a whole slew of choices to make as to the finish and the construction and and the kinds of hardware and all of that sort of thing. So, uh, and, and even the the custom manufactured products uh, are usually based on a. Um, manufactured components that are standard components. So you might have a, uh, a smoke vent for a roof that you need to have a certain size, but the manufacturer is not going to invent new components for that. They're just going to take their hardware and their normal door uh, and curb uh, profiles and make them to size to fit your particular project needs. Right. So this group, this manufactured products, is really something that we're looking at as something that the manufacturer is going to fully assemble in his shop, ship to the site, and in effect, you take it off of the truck and you attach it to the building somehow. And 
if you want to go to the next okay next frame here, Lewis, we can show some examples of what those things might be. I mean, and if you look through this list, each one of these things comes out to this site fully assembled. I mean, there's nothing that you need to do to a window when you unload it on, from the truck except to remove the packaging and then go and install it into the building. And you can say the same for all well, of these. There is one thing. Uh is that one should always look at the uh, instructions. Um, I investigated a leak a few, few years ago, David, and um, when I, I got to look at the windows and scratching my head and I realized that the contractor had installed them backwards. So, backwards. yes, they leaked. <laughs> yes, he put the inside side on the outside. And, there was no no surprise. So all he had to do was take them out and turn them around. <laughs> Interesting. Yes, but you do need to read the instructions. That's always a big help. <laughs> oh gosh. But that uh, does happen. But a lot of these things are, and some of these things um, also. There's some drawing implications. I don't know why. I t discourage m my people from detailing roof hatches. They come out of a box. The manufacturer's got a wonderful detail drawn, and probably they have in the manufacturer's instructions different details for built-up roof versus um, versus uh, a single ply, and you don't need to draw it generally. Okay. So what what sorts of things Oops, are we I going to do? went the wrong way. Ah, looks like you did. Okay. There we go. So here are the list of articles that we might expect to find for manufactured products. We're definitely going to name the product. So whatever the product name is, we're going to replace that article title that says product name with whatever the name actually happens to be. Because it's manufactured, I'd really expect to be able to name the manufacturer. So we and care about who makes these kind of products. Well, I would. I would certainly care about who's making my windows. As, as opposed to steel deck, floor deck. Yes, absolutely. I mean, like I said the, those other ones, like the decking that you mentioned, are more a commodity item. You know, it's a piece of sheet steel that somebody rolls, puts through some rollers. There's not a lot of magic there. But when you talk about a window, because the window has some performance requirements, yes, we do care who's making it and the kind of quality that they're bringing to the project. So I would name the manufacturers, and hopefully we'll name a couple or a basis of design at least, and then offer a description of what that window or what the manufactured product is supposed to be. And it's likely to have some form a performance or design criteria. And because it's assembled, if you think about the window, it could be a wood window, aluminum window, it could be a wood clad or clad wood window. So there might be multiple materials involved. So we may need to specify individual materials and then the finishes. And the finishes may be multiple finishes, one finish for each of the separate materials in the fabrication. And indeed, some uh, windows uh, would have one finish for the exterior and a different finish for the interior. You have right. wood wood windows that are have aluminum cladding on the outside, but uh, exposed wood on the inside. So, Lewis, here here's an interesting question. We've got this article title called "Accessories" highlighted as being probably included. Why would we do that? And what are all these accessories? <laughs> I usually think of that as the, the stuff that you need to install the products or the uh, s small ancillary things that, that would go with it. Um, so it might be the screws that you attach it with. Do you want stainless steel screws or cadmium plated screws or whatever? Um, the, if it's not supplied by the main manufacturer, uh, for example, if we were, uh, well, I'm, we, 
with your window example, I'm trying to <laughs> think of something that might go with that. But um, how, the, about a, how about a perimeter flashing, perhaps? Well, that's true. I was thinking of flashing being in a different section. But yeah, you could easily specify flashing in the window section, especially if you were uh, doing a, a project where you were replacing existing windows. You would probably put the flashing in there. And it doesn't come from the window manufacturer. So yes, that's an accessory product. That's an excellent back to your example. Steel deck, maybe a welding rod. Or the screws. Yes. The anchors. Um, Kevin O'Baron suggests an accessory for insulated pipe might be the tape required to seal up the joints in the jacketing. And, and yeah, he's absolutely right. And that's a, good to have a, an example from outside the normal architectural uh, uh, sections. Uh, we, thanks, Kevin. That's a great suggestion. I like having you jump in here, Kevin. That, that's great. Like the. Uh suggestions that you're offering. And we have one another question from Cliff Marvin asking where do unitized curtain walls belong. Cliff, we're going to get to that, but I'll tell you, you know where they really belong? On the outside of the wall. <laughs> Between you and the rain. Yeah, that's it. If we get it there, we should be good. Okay, so for the manufactured products then, because we're going to name the actual product, we're going to name the manufacturer. Oftentimes, these spec methods that we're going to use for these types of products are going to be a proprietary uh, specification method or a descriptive method. So the proprietary is easy. Gosh, if I could write all of my specs as a proprietary spec, I could probably do it in half the time and don't tell anybody but half the fee. Uh, go in, name the product, name the model, whatever it is, and be done. And literally, that's all you have to do. Well, uh, the only problem with that, David, is that if you name three manufacturers for aluminum windows, the contractors want to want to use number four. Oh, you never would have that happen, would you? And so sometimes it's handy to have a little bit of descriptive paragraph because when those substitutions requests come in, it may be in a year and a half later and the person who edited the specs or picked the windows in the first place is no longer with the firm and somebody's got to scramble around and try to figure out if this really is a comparable product. So by doing that, we can, one, head off some substitutions by say, by communicating to people what we want and what we don't want. And uh, two, it makes it easier for the people who are reviewing submittals to make sure that they're getting what uh, is actually desired. I think there's another alternative. OK. I think we need to train the architects. <laughs> I, 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 you're laughing, and I'm serious. Believe it or not, I just started working with a, a new client architect this week. In his attitude, there are no substitutions. He's naming products. We're specifying the products that he wants, and there are no substitutions. Well, we we do try to follow that as much as we can, but but um, the problem is in real life, often the the contractor and the owner have these little chats offline and uh, the owner will tell us to look at the contractor substitutions but uh, yes they're best avoided <laughs> okay yes you got to keep the owner happy absolutely I'll give you that All right. our next next category is shop assemblies and uh, these are things that where um, you may have multiple products that go together to make up the assembly uh, and different some of the components may require some limited field assembly but the primary work for making this thing whatever it is is done off-site in a shop and in some place, cases it's actually a contractor or manufacturer designed or at least partly designed and some examples are these. 
Um, metal stairs is a, is a very good example. Again, when we have standard manufactured components, but they have to be cut to length and make sure that it's the right width and, and fit your floor to floor height that's going to be different from the next project that the manufacturer does. And here's Clifford's unitized curtain wall. Yes, and hopefully it's in the right place. <laughs> um, and, and and Kevin I offers another, uh, Kevin O'Byrne offers a, yet another example is uh, prefabricated roof presses. And that's yeah, an excellent absolutely. example. absolutely. Right. And, and if you look at this list and mm -hmm. you look at the examples, even what Kevin's offering, oftentimes these are the things that come back as a delegated design item because there's some structural component. Uh, you look at the precast, the metal stairs, the curtain wall, certainly not the architectural woodwork, or but the ductwork could very well be a um, delegated design. Uh, the roof trusses well, certainly could be a delegated design. So when we start getting into those uh, kinds of applications where it is a delegated design, I think these shop assemblies are you really fit the bill and the kind of the approach that we're using to specify this group uh, so when you're looking at these delegated designs start thinking about them as these shop assemblies and here's some suggested uh, articles that might be used is to talk about the, the basically this, the system or the assembly name. Um, often we're going to list manufacturers, even for precast, although you may specify that as being um, a PCA certified uh, fabricator up in part one, and we don't care who makes it, but sometimes you list them by name. Um, and uh, certainly the performance or design criteria. Design criteria is very important too in terms of what does this thing look like and uh, maybe every bit as important as uh, how much strength can it hold up, how much weight can it hold up. Or design criteria could even be what is its size because think about the precast wall panel, perhaps if it's greater than six inches thick it's not going to fit. Okay. So I, I think because these are shop assembled products that the main reliance is going to be on, as we say here, the description, the performance, and then finally the assembly. You know, how is the manufacturer actually putting all of this together before it gets shipped to the site? Because we're, we're expecting all of these products to arrive on the site essentially fully factory assembled, so that all we have to do is attach them one to another or attach them to the building that's already there and then finish them with all of the interfaces between that particular material and the surrounding materials. And so <clears throat> this is the first category then that we've seen where source quality control is something that we want to think about because uh, we want the fabricator of the precast to look at each panel very closely before they sh before shipping it to the site so that we don't have a bunch of cracked and spalled panels showing up that we just have to turn around and send right back. We, and there may be even some testing involved as necessary. Right. And Tommy Smith just ch chimed in. Uh, and his comment is the latest section format relocated system description from part one to part two. As it that's did. That's absolutely right. Also and, the and performance and design criteria. Right. And those two are probably the, the ones that give away as to what version of section format uh, the specifier is following. And I believe by this time that all of the major uh, commercial master specifications, you know, master spec, spec link, uh, in, I don't know, is there another at this point? Uh, spec text, 
I, how can I forget that one? Uh, <laughs> they've all they have all moved over to the latest version, the section format. So you should, if you're following all of those masters, be looking at this kind of an arrangement as opposed to the previous version where performance and system description were in part one. And so here are the, some of the common spec methods that you might find for this kind of uh, product is that really it's all four. Although some of them, as uh, David has mentioned, uh, uh, we don't need to necessarily to specify performance requirements for architectural woodwork. But uh, uh, we often use a combination of these to uh, for the, some of these complex uh, assemblies. Okay. Field assemblies. We're coming down to the end. We're, we've got about 10 minutes left, which I think is perfect for where we are in this. But Lewis, I think what I'm going to do, because I have to go present a session here at the academies, we'll get through field assemblies, and then I'm going to have to bail out on yes. you, and you're going to have to finish. OK. So I can okay. correct all the things that you said after you leave. Or make fun of me. <laughs> oh, I would never do that. <laughs> OK. So field assembly, these are really uh, things that we're trying to buy that the contractor is ultimately responsible for assembling the entire system. So it's going to be individual products that, are, that we're going to specify that get put together in the field uh, this would be, for instance, instead of unitized curtain wall, uh, would be site assembled curtain wall. This could be, uh, with the examples here, a masonry wall, a masonry cavity wall. We're going to specify the brick and the block and the ties, but it's up to the contractor to actually create this assembly. And the same for any finished carpentry, membrane, roofing, stucco. Uh, we're relying entirely on the mechanics in the field to create the assembly. So we're only specifying individual components. In but while we're talking about response but while we're talking about responsibility, we also have to point out that when we are specifying assemblies where the different where we're taking products from different manufacturers and putting them together for some uh, functional element that the designer now takes responsibility for the performance of that masonry wall or that stucco system. Whereas with curtain wall, if we buy the, the curtain wall system from a single manufacturer, even though we put glass in, in it, the curtain wall manufacturer will provide a warranty for water infiltration, air infiltration, and so forth, and will stand behind that installation. Right, and you're right, because this one, this category, is one where we're relying on the mechanics in the field, so the designer has to take responsibility for this performance. He has to actually detail the assemblies to make sure that they work, specify the right products and all of the right accessories to bring all of these products together and have them perform as a complete assembly. So the primary article titles then that we're looking for in part two is certainly the system and assembly name, a description, and all of the materials that go together to uh, form the assembly. There may be manufacturers, because we're relying on uh, individual component, basic uh, component products to, to make up the assembly, but there may not be any manufacturers. There might be some performance and design criteria that the overall assembly has to uh, provide. That refers to installation issues more than Correct. the constituent products. Correct. But this one, too, I believe the importance of the accessories becomes more so than any of the others because they're, they're likely to be uh, a longer list of accessories to be able to complete 
these assemblies, things that are not the primary materials. And here, for the first time, we, we see mixes because cast-in-place concrete is a, a perfect example of this, where we take a bunch of products from different manufacturers and the contractor has to manufacture something on site from all those bits and pieces. And so we're going to specify something about how that site manufacturing, uh, the, how much water goes into it and so forth, uh, works. We have a question from Tommy. Um, does Dave typically include CMU insulation, brick veneer, and damp proofing in a single section or in separate sections with references, cross-references between them? Well, I can answer. I don't know why you're picking on me, Tommy. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I typically do not uh, specify the insulation uh, with the masonry. Uh, I, I do rely on uh, separate sections. The damp proofing would be the same, uh, but with with the summary sec, uh, text that I was describing earlier, in I may in those descriptions end up in effect a reference to another section uh, where the other materials would be specified. And, and partly that has to do with. Although we don't strictly divide specs by who's going to do what, we all know that some things like the air barrier are going to be installed by somebody different than the guy that's laying the brick and putting in the flashing and the top brick ties and the whips. Yep. And I will tell you if it's in Philadelphia and if it's black, it's going to be installed by a roofer. <laughs> And our common specification methods for these things are the reference standards and, again, descriptive. Descriptive gets used a lot. Right. So, well, Dave, you want to bug out, and we I appreciate you. I'm sorry to leave you and, and miss out on all the fun here, but uh, <laughs> I do have to bail and go take care of the class here. All right, so a pleasure joining all of you. Have fun with Lewis, and I will see you next month. Okay. Thanks, Dave. And finally, we have uh, design build systems where we're talking about complete systems. Uh, they're field assembled. They may be field assembled from standard manufactured components, and there is a major amount of contractor design that may be structural, it may be aesthetic, it may be something else. Um, and here are some examples. Uh, you can, of course, do whole buildings and metal uh, building systems that provide the structure as, as well as the building enclosure and the uh, insulation for the exterior walls and the roof. Um, a lot of decorative canopies are designed this way because they involve some special uh, space frames and glazing and one thing and another and we can draw them pretty pictures but we don't necessarily know how to put together the parts for it. Uh, sprinklers are almost always done this way. Uh, even the building code recognizes that, that the contract documents for sprinkler systems are going to be in the form of approved shops uh, drawings and it specifically states that in uh, chapter one of the IBC. Uh, David and I have a lot of experience doing entertainment and hospitality projects and we get into some special uh, things like that, uh, fiberglass and other things. That <coughs> I did a project a few years ago where I had to specify a uh, an ornamental wall that had flames coming out of openings in a metal wall. And I wasn't about to uh, even let my plumbing uh, engineer tell me about what size pipes and what valves and so forth to use for something like that. We wanted to pick a specialty contractor who knew what he was doing to uh, design as well as fabricate and install. So that's it's common that not only are they 
fabricated and designed by the by the contractor, but they also are installed by the same entity. And uh, again, here are the, the typical article headings that we're going to use. Uh, description, performance, design criteria can be very important in this kind of thing because again, now we're talking about uh, making a metal building look good, not just um, utilitarian, for example. And I've worked on a couple of church projects and they make great buildings. They're very economical and you can do things with the roof slope that, you know, doesn't have to look like a barn. Uh, the, the Clifford uh, points out that uh, another good example would be uh, the decorative fountains that you see in Vegas in front of the Bellagio and other places and all of those uh, special theme elements in, the, in Las Vegas, the pirate ships and so forth. I did one time write for a museum a specification for a reproduction 1840s steamboat. But uh, and that was fun. That was fun. Um, the common spec methods, of course, reference standards for uh, the basic materials and concepts, uh, and of course the descriptive and the performance requirements. So that uh, is our basic introduction to some ideas that we hope will help you figure out when you're looking at a product, which of these articles in part two do I need to specify this product? And of course in some of our sections, depending upon how broad the scope of the section is, you may want to have um, <clears throat> uh, combined some of the methods that we've talked about here. And there we could also come up with some other categories. The, the five that we've presented today are just you know, one way of looking at uh, the product, but there are, we could come up and think of other ways to divide that up. We had a suggestion from Kevin O'Baron for a future session on how to properly specify delegation of professional design services. And, uh, I think that would be a great thing for David to talk to us about. But uh, we'll, we do appreciate suggestions because this, we really want this uh, specifying practice group to be your group. And if you have ideas and suggestions, uh, please keep the cards and letters coming in. We want to know what you need to know about. Um, and. Uh, so please uh, give us the benefit of, of your ideas and concepts, and we'd be happy to, to work with you. And if you have ideas even for special guest speakers, we did that last year for the first time. We had a couple of different ones, and uh, we would like to do more of that in the future.